were the methods of Italian unification successful? So we're going to start talking about the unification of Italy and then eventually the unification of Germany tomorrow. So the first question, how did the Crimean War, which was from 1854 to 1856, allow for nationalist movements to strengthen in Europe. Now we talked about the Crimean War and AP World because it's a pretty big turning point for Russia. It's the thing that kind of prompts Russia to begin to um, modernize and industrialize and end their serfdom. But for Italy, Italy actually fights in the Crimean War for kind of a very odd reason. But here we can see when we talk about Italy in this instance, I'm talking about particularly Piedmont Sardinia. If you remember from the Revolution of 1848, I told you Piedmont and Sardinia was the only kingdom um, in Italy that was actually being controlled by Italians. So Piedmont and Sardinia is actually going to fight on the side of the French and the British um, in the Crimean War, but they're hoping to gain something in return. Obviously, they're not just going to, you know, fight to fight. But so the Crimean War, Russia, as we know, was expansionist, was pushing on the on the borders of the Ottoman Empire hoping to be able to gain access out of the Black Sea in a series of wars that are sometimes referred to as the Russo-Turkish Wars. Russia tried to claim themselves as the protector of Christian people living in the Ottoman Empire and Christians living in Jerusalem. But France, for whatever reason, I still don't fully understand this, but France had always claimed they really had the right to do that, to protect Christian interests in the Ottoman Empire. And Napoleon III, in particular, who was the ruler of France at the time, encourage the Ottoman Sultan to resist Russia's claims to be the protector of Christians and also claims on trying to get more land in the Ottoman Empire. Um, so in 1853, a war breaks out between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And France and Great Britain and Piedmont Sardinia wind up siding with the Ottomans, all fighting over this region here that's referred to as Crimea. Now you can see it's another image of Crimea. So, um, and I'll talk a bit in a second why Piedmont gets involved, but Britain is going to wind up blockading Russia in the Baltic Seas um, and Black Seas. France and Britain also are going to invade Russia on the Crimean Peninsula. Austria did not want Russia to gain lands in the Balkans at all and didn't want France and Britain to be victorious either. So this was also in some ways, remember, Piedmont Sardinia sees Austria as a major blockage to the idea of a unified Ital Italy because P uh, Austria controls Lombardy and Venetia, which is in northeastern Italy. So part of the reason why Piedmont Sardinia wanted to get involved in this war is it's a way to kind of go against Austria, who was against what was happening. Um, now, Tsar Nicholas I dies in 1855. Alexander II becomes Tsar. He wanted peace. So a Congress meets in 1856. Um, to negotiate peace. But before we get to that, that's some of the fighting. British forces in the Crimean War. Um, here we can see this is the Charge of the Light Brigade, um, which if you look here, it's right here, the Battle of Balaclava. Um, and so this was a poem romanticized uh, by Alfred Lord Tennyson in which he says, Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death, rode the 600, forward the light brigade, charged for the guns, he said, into the valley of death, rode the 600. Um, so you can see some more of the fighting going on. And Florence Nightingale, um, kind of gained, who's a famous nurse, came, gained prominence um, as a result of helping British soldiers during this war. So, Tsar Nicholas II, like I said, dies in 1855. Alexander II wants peace, so a Congress meets in Paris in 1856 to negotiate a peace. Um, as a result, no Russian or Ottoman naval forces are allowed on the Black Sea, and all the major powers agree to respect the political integrity of the Ottoman Empire. So Russia is essentially pushed back the borders of the Ottoman Empire remain intact. Russia gives up its claims as the protector of Ottoman Christians. Romania and Serbia become self-governing principalities with the protection of European powers. Um, is basically the agreement that happens at the end of all of this. And that's our Nicholas I and then Alexander II. So Piedmont Sardinia gets involved in this war, number one, to annoy Austria. And number two... 
as a way, and this is going to sound very strange, but as a way to kind of advance Italy. It's almost like getting the name of Italy out there by being involved in a major war that they really have no part in whatsoever. But... That takes us to this question. Why does Piedmont become the force behind Italian unification? So just to be clear again, where Piedmont Sardinia is. So this is Sardinia. This is Piedmont. They were separate. And then in 1815, they become Piedmont Sardinia. Now, one thing I just want to also point out to Corsica, which is, belongs to France, originally was Italian. And that's where Napoleon is from. Just a little FYI, because Napoleon was originally referred to as Bonaparte and not Bonaparte. Anyway, so getting back to Piedmont Sardinia. So Piedmont or Sardinia, whatever you want to call it, or Sardinia Piedmont, um, was the only native Italian dynasty in Italy. And they, in a lot of ways, were the buffer between France and Austria because you have, you know, Nice here, which is France, and then you have Lombardy and Venetia, which is controlled by Austria. So they're kind of the buffer um, between the two. Um, they were a liberal nation state, um, Piedmont Sardinia. They did have a king, um, Victor Emmanuel II. Remember, we talked about him the other day. Um, so they did have a king, but they were essentially a liberal nation state. Um, and But what we're also seeing during this time is a movement in a lot of ways led by Mazzini, who we mentioned the other day, this idea of the Risorgimento. And the Risorgimento, which means resurgence, was this movement to bring... Italy together. Now, a lot of people are going to look to Piedmont Sardinia because they are this liberal, more orderly, moderate government, that this becomes the better option for unified Italy rather than the radical republicanism that someone like a Mazzini or a Garibaldi would have been advocating for. So Mazzini, though, with the Risorgimento, you see here is referred to as the heart, um, he transforms Italian unification into a moral purpose through his writings. He made the cause of a unified Italy almost something almost holy. And he brought a, like a great deal of emotional fervor to the cause. He's the ones bringing in the nationalism. In 1831, he formed something called the Young Italy Society in his desire to drive Austria out of Italy and create a republic. And then we have, like I mentioned last uh, the other day, we have Garibaldi, who I'll talk about a little bit later. He becomes known as the sword. And we have Cavour, who is the prime minister of Piedmont, and he's referred to as the head. And then King Victor Emmanuel, who's eventually going to become king of Italy. Um, so that's kind of our major players when we talk about Italian unification. That's an image of Mazzini. So why will a Republican revolution in Italy not work? Italy is the founder of the Republic. The Romans were the ones who invented the Republic. So why will a Republic not work in Italy? It kind of doesn't make sense. But the big thing is Pope Pius IX, who is the spoiler. Remember, after the events of the revolutions of 1848, the Pope was completely turned against Italian unification and becomes an arch conservative. Um, now, the problem is, and here you can see Garibaldi defending Rome against the French, which didn't work out very well because the French took over. Um, but basically, the big problem is is how to get Austria out of Italy in order to be able to lead forward with a unified Italy. And not only get Austria out of Italy, because after 1848, there were also French troops stationed in Rome protecting the Pope. And so that's another roadblock um, blocking an advancement towards Italian unification. So here we see um, Cavour says... The history of every age proves that no people can attain a high degree of intelligence and morality unless its feeling of nationality is strongly developed. The noteworthy fact is an inevitable consequence of the laws that rule human nature. Therefore, if we so ardently desire the emancipation of Italy, if we declare that in the face of this great question, all the petty questions that divide us must be silenced, it is not only that we may see our country glorious and powerful, but that above all we may elevate her in intelligence and moral development up to the plane of the most civilized nations. This union we preach with such ardor, it is not so difficult to obtain as one might suppose if one judged only by exterior appearances or if one were preoccupied with our unhappy divisions. Nationalism has become general, it grows daily, and it has already grown strong enough to keep all parts of Italy united despite the, distinct, the differences that distinguish them. 
So a little bit about um, Cavour. So Cavour, I mentioned before, is the prime minister of Piedmont Sardinia, um, which was a constitutional monarchy. And the kingdom of Piedmont realized that they're not getting Austria out of Italy without a whole bunch of aid. Now, this document here kind of relates to the idea of nationality and the idea that you know being Italian is something that can unite the people more so than anything else, which is not necessarily something that Cavour would have actually believed. Cavour was <coughs> a very cunning statesman. He's going to be very similar when we talk tomorrow about the unification of Germany. He's going to be very similar to a Bismarck. Um, he was, like I said before, a cunning statesman. He actually began as a strong conservative. He kind of flip-flops in his political views. He makes a fortune in investing in railroads and reforming agriculture and editing a newspaper. And he felt that improvement of agriculture, improvement of trade is going to lead to the reduction of the power of the church. He was very anti-clerical. He did not feel that the church should have so much power with, within Italy. He also, though, was not sympathetic to the revolutionary and republican nationalism of Mazzini. What he really believes is it makes economic sense for Italy to be united. Italy is a peninsula, and so economic, geographically, it makes sense for them to be united, and that would help be, aid Italy economically. Even though in this document he's talking about how nationalism grows daily and it's become strong enough to keep all parts of Italy united, that's not really where he's coming from. He's coming from the idea that a united Italy makes economic sense. He's willing to sound kind of nationalistic, but he really isn't that necessarily nationalistic. And you have to also remember that Italy is very, very divided regionally. There's a very strong sense of regionalism that exists in Italy, and that goes back to her centuries, Italy being so disunited and divided up into city-states, if you think all the way back to the Renaissance. But so here, Cavour and Napoleon III meet in 1858. Because I'll go back to what I said before. Napoleon, uh, excuse me, Cavour realizes that Austria needs to be removed from Italy if Italy is going to be united. And that Piedmont Sardinia cannot do that on their own. So P, uh, Cavour believed in what we refer to as politics of reality. He didn't really approve of Republicans, but he was willing to work with them. Didn't approve of war, but was willing to use it to unite Italy. So he realized he needed to pit one great power against another. So he basically needs to get Austria out of Italy. He used the Crimean War already to bring Italy into European politics. There was a lot of respect for Piedmont because Piedmont was seen as the more orderly, moderate government as opposed to some of the plots that Mazzini was trying to cook up for a Republican government in Italy. So he was, they were seen, Piedmont was seen as the moderate liberal alternative to Republicanism. And so what he decides to do, because again, he's against war, but willing to use war if he needs it. He makes an alliance with Napoleon III and provokes a war with Austria, knowing that he's going to have the support of the French. And Napoleon was willing to fight because he had traveled extensively and had fought in the past in Italy. And he also felt to fight Austria for Italian nationalism would make him appear more liberal back home in France, and this would help his image back in France. So the Empress stated this by saying that he, <coughs> excuse me, started by saying that he had decided to support Sardinia with all his forces in a war against Austria, provided that that war was undertaken for a non-revolutionary cause, which could be justified in the eyes of diplomacy and still more of public opinion in France and Europe. So this war begins. Now, the war starts. And Piedmont and France are doing really well. And they're winning a whole bunch of battles. This is the Austro-Sardinian War of 1859. Now, they were overthrowing governments in, Lar in Lombardy and, Vene and um, parts of northern central Italy. Things were going well. Um, and some of these groups, like Lombardy, actually wanted to be annexed by Piedmont. They wanted to become part of Piedmont. Um, but... Catholics denounced the war because the Pope was against this idea of a um, united Italy. And that kind of creates a dilemma for Napoleon II because 
if the Pope is denouncing it and France has troops in Rome to protect the Pope against Republican uprisings, this kind of puts the Pope into a difficult situation. I mean, excuse me, puts Napoleon into a difficult situation. So at the height of the victories, France makes peace with Austria in July of, um, in, in July of 1860. No, in July of 1859. Sorry. So in July of 1859, they make peace. Um, and so what happens is there's an agreement made between France and Austria. France and Austria give Lombardy to Piedmont. So this area here goes to Piedmont, but left Venetia as part of Austria. And there would be a federal union of the existing Italian governments ruled by the Pope. So basically Napoleon kind of betrays Piedmont and gives Italy to the Pope, who doesn't even really want there to be a united Italy. So this was not what the Italians wanted, and the revolution continued to spread. The northern Italian kingdoms that get annexed by Piedmont hold plebiscites. And in 1860, we see the first parliament of a enlarged Ital northern Italian kingdom, basically. The British recognized this new government, as did France, since France was given Nice and Savoy. Since those two areas Piedmont gave to France, France was willing to recognize this new kind of larger northern Italian um, kingdom. So in 1860, we have a northern Italian kingdom, which is like Piedmont, Parma, Lombardy, these areas here. But we still have papal states in the middle. And then we still have the kingdom of the two Sicilies in the south. So we don't have a fully unified Italy. Um, so here we see Victor Emmanuel says, who becomes this king of this new enlarged Italian kingdom, he says, free and nearly entirely united. The opinion of civilized nations is favorable to us. The just and liberal principles now prevailing in the councils of Europe are favorable to us. Italy herself too will become a guarantee of order and peace and will once more be an efficacious instrument of universal civilization. These facts have inspired the nation with great confidence in its own destinies. I take pleasure in manifesting to the first parliament in Italy the joy I feel in my heart as king and soldier. So yeah, they're talking about a unified Italy, but there's not really a unified Italy. So that takes us to this question. How did Garibaldi, we talked to, I said I'd mention him, how does Garibaldi make Italian unification possible? So remember, Garibaldi and Mazzini were buds, and they were involved with the ill-fated revolution of 1848. So Garibaldi is going to organize his, what are referred to as his red shirts. He calls his followers the red shirts. So he has 1,150 followers. They're also referred to as Garibaldi's thousand, even though they're not a thousand, and they go for an exhibition south. And <clears throat> he's being backed by Cavour, but Cavour is not publicly backing him. So basically he lands in Sicily. He wins a whole bunch of victories. And then, even though this arrow doesn't quite, I got to fix that arrow. Yeah, he lands in Sicily. There we go. He lands in Sicily. And then he quickly kind of puts down the government in Sicily because the Sicilian government, which is part of this kingdom of the two Sicilies, which was the Spanish guys that were ruling Italy, um, not exactly very popular, kind of a corrupt government. So he quickly gains more followers and they cross over into, into the mainland. And the government of Naples, which is the other Sicily and the government of the two Sicilies, they collapse pretty quickly as well. So now Garibaldi is you know, gaining all these followers and he's moving towards Rome, which is going to cause a problem for Cavour. This will cause an international scandal because you have French popes there in Rome, number one. And number two, Cavour is seen as the liberal, moderate, stable alternative to crazies like Garibaldi and Mazzini. Meanwhile, Cavour is backing Garibaldi. So what Cavour does is he sends troops to meet Garibaldi's forces in Naples, which is about today, about a three hour train ride south of Rome. So pretty close to Rome. Um, and he convinces Garibaldi to accept a monarchy. And so basically Garibaldi, the famous cartoon, do I have an image of it? 
yes, this is the famous cartoon, is Garibaldi is seen as putting the boot of Italy on Victor Emmanuel, because even though Garibaldi was a Republican and he didn't want to see a monarchy ruling Italy, he was willing to put his love of country and his love of the idea of a unified Italy over the type of government that it would have. So he decides to stop fighting, stop moving towards Rome, accept a monarchy. So then there was plebiscites held and they all voted for a unified Italy. But what this still means, still not fully unified. Where's that map? Still not fully unified because Venetia is still part of Italy and part of Austria, excuse me, and Rome is still being ruled by the Pope. So even though we're talking about Italy being Italy in 1861, it's really not in 1861. Venetia is eventually added in 1866, and Rome is annexed in 1870. And then we fully have a unified Italy. So the Italian, the Kingdom of Italy really officially is created in 1871. Um, but so this is from Garibaldi. He says, in the name of Italian unity, union, excuse me, with, without which liberty and in independence can never gladden the heart of Italy, I summon you to the unifying banner of King Victor Emmanuel. Let all among you whose souls burn with the sacred love of Italy forget their differences and embrace for your country's sake. With that noble intention, the liberals of the Libre Comise, an old political society, have transformed their association into that of the Nagione Armata, I'm massacring the Italian, and with that same intention I have accepted its presidency. May our example be universally followed so that union among brothers should cease to be a mere wish and become a fact. Let right supported by arms be our program. Let the liberation of Italy be our only wish. Closely joined in one phalanx, we shall henceforth have but one enemy before us and shall live only in the hopes of Italian liberty. This is from the London Times. Florence correspondent furnishes the following antidote regarding his holiness, who is considered authentic. A few days ago, he was walking out of the Porta Angelica, preceded and followed by his noble guards, accompanied by two monsiori. He was conversing with these prelates on various matters when he stopped short before an old countryman who was kneeling on the high road, soliciting his blessing. Are you a Christian? asked the Pope. And as the poor fellow, all taken back, was dumb, the question again was again repeated with sharp eagerness. Please, your holiness, I am Santo Padre, si. At last stammered out the countryman. Do you know the Ten Commandments? Prefer, pursue the, apolo, the ap, apostolical catist? Santo Padre C was again the answer. Whereupon the pontiff bade, bade him to tell him one by one. The poor dumbfounded fellow tried one or two, then jumped over to the fifth or sixth, preceded his mistake, and his confusion became worse, con, became worse confounded till he fairly broke. The pope then walked on with his suite and said triumphantly, let the people learn God's commandments by heart and then they will be fit for independence. So the Pope was not really on board with this whole idea of a unified Italy. And like I said, he's going to be someone that's going to be a roadblock for it for quite some time. But that takes us to this question. Was Italian unification complete? You might be like, well, yeah, Mrs. Gerlam, you just said all these countries are now part of Italy. But Nationalists felt the unification was not complete. There were other areas with large populations still out of Italy. Also, the occupation of Rome in 1870 opened the rift between the church and the state because good patriots had to be anti-clerical and good Catholics had to hate the Italian state, which kind of creates a quandary. Now, you also have the issue of regional differences between the north and the south. The north felt that the south was very backwards because the north is where most of your industry is. There was a great deal of lawlessness in Naples and Sicily for years of being ruled by the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which was kind of corrupt. The government was parliamentary, but not very democratic. Out of 20 million people living in Italy, only 600,000 had the right to vote. Um, and like again, Italy had a very strong sense of regionalism. Separate dialects, separate cultures. Really, the idea of an Italian language has actually been a rather newer concept, really, with um, TV can you actually like unify the Italian language? So the Italian people, there's a strong sense of differences even to this day amongst Italy. This though is in Rome. This is the monument to King Victor Emmanuel to commemorate the unification of Italy. Um, so I want you to answer this question. Why was Italy able to become united? And of all these figures, who do you think was the most important and why?